phone out. I'm not texting anybody. I'm finding these questions that I have for him. Let's see here. 
Is this the best office of mine you've seen? Yes. That's easy. Yeah. That was. And you look at the numbers that this team generated, it's hard to argue. I mean, we our records, my records, what of the research I've done, is, is incomplete. Uh, but if you go back and you just look at points scored, you look at yards gained per carry, and then we, you had passing offense too, not great numbers, but really good numbers passing the ball. You don't get those kind of numbers without a great offensive line. Uh, and uh, those guys played together for a long time, and it showed this year. The little guy right there in the middle had a lot to do with it. But uh, he's one of the fieriest guys I've ever seen on a football team. But yes, best team I've seen. Obviously. Speaking of that little guy down there in the middle, this, and I don't, I don't know if him or one of his brothers put this in, but one of the questions was, who was your favorite priest brother? <laughs> No question, that's a loaded question. And I would just bet you about a thousand dollars Gary Priest sent that question in. I would think that Chattanooga Notre Dame or Knoxville Catholic has never had a program or a, or anybody else in the state has ever had a program with four priests on it before. Now think about that. You've had Pat, you've had Patrick, you've had Hunter, and now you've got Gary. And we've also got a guy that preaches on this team, so we ought to be very religious, right? But uh, I, I went back. Pat, I think, I think Pat's last year was '84. Does that sound right? Something like that. Uh, played for John Mullinax. So of course, uh, then uh, prior to uh, Garrett, it was uh, Hunter, and it was about 2014. Somewhere around in there, and then I guess uh, Patrick was before that in about 2012, somewhere in there. There's no way I'm going to answer this question. <laughs> so uh, I, I've enjoyed watching all the priests play. There's no doubt in my mind. Of course, I'm a little closer to this team than I have been to other teams, but uh, there's no doubt in my mind who was the. Well, I, I said this a moment ago, fiery, but this guy right here. Garrett loves this game as much as anybody I have ever seen. I'm not saying he's the best. I'd never say that. All those guys can play. They all started. Some of them played two ways. Garrett never got the chance to play on the defensive line, but the other guys played on the other side of the line occasionally too. But uh, all good players that help make this program what it is. All right. Uh, what is the highest ranking of a Big Ben team at the end of a regular season? 1975, McMinn County was ranked number two in the state. They were 10-0. Um, Chattanooga Baylor was number one. This was before um, the public-private split, so McMinn still had to compete with private schools. You know, during during the, when the playoffs in 1975, they weren't done in regions like they are now. You know, you can take the top four teams for the region or whatever, four plays, one, so on and so forth. Back then, in 75, your, your games were on a point system. If you played somebody that was the same classification as you, there were only three classifications at that. If you played somebody in the same classification, you got 10 points. If you played somebody for in a lower classification than you, you only got five points. So McMinn played McMinn Central that year, and McMinn Central was a double-A team, so McMinn only got five points for winning that game. So at the end of the year, they had 95 points. They won 10 games at 95 points and were not going to make the playoffs because uh, Warren County was 10-0, would not have know after nine games. They had 90 points while McMinn had 85. And in the last game of the year, Cumberland County upset Warren County and that gave them a loss. That's the only way McMinn got in the playoffs with a 10-0 record in 1975. But they were ranked number two, and, and Baylor was ranked number one. They played at McMinn, and uh, McMinn beat them 14-7. They went on and lost to the Gold Bridge in the uh, second round, which was at that time the city finals of the state playoffs. All right, uh, let's see here. And that would be the furthest any team has gotten to the playoffs. Well, that's the only team that ever got to the city finals. Uh, McMinn has had uh, three or four teams that have gotten to the third round. Uh, 
1987, they got to the third round, lost to Jefferson County. Todd Collins playing on that team, they ended up playing for the Patriots. Uh, was from uh, yeah, Jeff County's team that they kind of lost to. Mark was on that team, I think. Mark Lockmiller was in 87. And uh, bitterly cold night. But they have made it to the third round on three or four different occasions, but all other occasions it was only the quarterfinals. So they've only been to the semifinals once, but it was the second round at that time. There were less, less teams in the playoffs. All right, and somebody's wanting some wide receiver records. Well, you have that. The closest thing I have to wide receiver records, when you brought this up, there's only one guy in the history of the school that has his jersey retired who was a wide receiver, and that's Jack Clark. Uh, Jack graduated in 1968, played on the 66 and 67 team. He, um, and he was a sophomore. He had seven touchdown catches as a junior. He had 16. He had 11 touchdown catches as a senior. So 34 touchdown catches receiving. He also had a rushing touchdown, he had an interception for a touchdown, and he had a punt return for a touchdown, so he had a total of 37 touchdowns. Back then, when they named the All-State teams, they didn't name a 1A and a 2A and a 3A and a 4A and a 5A and a 6A and so on and so forth. There was one team, one team for the state, and he was sports writer's first team All-State when he was a senior. He was honorable mention All-State when he was a junior. He had 10 touchdowns of 50 yards or more. He had one for 95, one for 93, one for 81, one for 79, one for 62, one for 66. Pierce could fling it. And he just rear back throw it. Most times just let Jackie go get it. And he could go get it. And uh, he was an outstanding receiver. Um, Several of those against Bradley, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, 1966, McMinn beat Bradley 71 to seven. And, uh, yeah, that was good. Uh, here's three, eight touchdown passes that night. Six of them were to Jackie Clark. That's uh, the game that uh, I actually saw. It was at the uh, old Bradley Field, but it was uh, they, were, they were a special combination. He's the best McMinn receiver I've ever seen, and I would, and I would think he probably has to be. You know, back in the older days, they didn't throw the ball here that much. Back in the 40s, McMinn had some pretty good teams back in the 40s, but they didn't throw the ball. All right. Uh, one name you did not mention on either of those records was stats about Bo Cable. Well, that was getting to that. <laughs> and I, I want to know which one of y'all asked that. Somebody <laughs> asked about his record. I don't know if you talk about his, his playing records or his coaching record, but um, he led the team in receiving for three consecutive years. 92, <laughs> 93, and 94. Don't tell him how many catches. <laughs> Had a total of 51 catches. Three years, 657 yards, and nine touchdowns. He also carried the ball 14 times when he was a senior for 100, for other 94 yards and a touchdown. He returned 22 punts for 156 yards and a touchdown, and he returned 29 kickoffs for 475 yards. Fumbled the ball one time, he had one interception. He led the team in kickoff returns on a couple of occasions. He led the team in punt returns, I think, on one occasion. So this guy could play a little bit. Leather helmets with even leather. Helmets. <laughs> he, um, 14 years, is that right? 14. 14 years. So he and John Wallach together have uh, 33 years coaching together. And uh, I have his record, but I can't find it right now. But uh, you know what it is. No, I don't. Actually. Actually. <laughs> I'll find it. That's right. okay. Okay. All right, let's see. Uh, We do not have the defensive records. Somebody did ask that in one of the guys that you have. Any records does Jalen Hunt hold? School records, and what are they? Once again, everything that I have is, is uh, I'm not 100% sure. You know, I've been doing this in 73, and I've been keeping numbers probably since about 75. Um, back in, in the 40s when uh, your grandfather was in the 50s, back in the early to mid 50s when your grandfather was coaching, um, they had some outstanding teams back then. That back then they had, I, I should have gotten this number, but I don't have it. They had about 
15 or 16 people in a two or three year stretch that signed D1 scholarships. Um, Wayne Grubb went to the University of Tennessee to play, Jim Cartwright went to UT to play, they combined uh, to uh, beat Billy Cannon and LSU when uh, Billy Cannon was the Heisman Trophy winner and they were the number one team in the country along with Cotton Lettner, those two guys who played over Mexico. The three of those guys combined late in the game to make a huge stop on, on Billy Cannon. And uh, those teams were loaded with talent, but I have no numbers for those teams. I, of course, I've got scores, I know scoring averages and things like that. But, uh, uh, so when we say that Jalen holds the record, I feel 99% confident uh, that that is the record, but I'm not positive. But I just can't see anybody else having numbers other than these. Jalen has the number one spot in uh, single game rushing. He carried the ball 30 times for 368 yards and five touchdowns last year here in Athens against Bradley. Um, he has the number three spot in single game. It's 20 carries, 310 yards, five touchdowns against Ulawa. That was this year. And he also holds the number five spot single game rushing. 24 carries, 293 yards, five touchdowns against Bradley down there this year. Two games against Bradley, he had 661 yards and 10 touchdowns. Bring that back. He, um, he has, when we consider all 11 of his games that he played this year, um, he had rushed for 2,452 yards, which is the most that anybody has ever carried, most yardage gained in a single season for McMahon, 27 touchdowns, averaged 10.8 yards per carry. Also, if, if you just look at a regular season, 10 games this year, he gained 2,161 yards and, and got 24 touchdowns this year. So uh, he's got that. We know he has the single game rushing record. He has to have it. We know he has to have the single game, uh, or rather the single season rushing record. He has to have that. And he's at uh, 5,700 yards, 57 some odd yards for his career. And I feel very comfortable saying he is a career rushing leader at McMahon County as well. He played all four years at McMahon. He's got numbers that are just, uh, they're mad numbers. They're just, uh, they, they don't happen. And I don't think they're ever going to be broken to take the truth. And the, the last one was, uh, somebody made the comment that anything Johnny has to say would be interesting. So I, I felt that was an open-ended one for you, if you had something to well, let me just give you a little bit more history. I'm a history buff as well as a McMean County fan, and somebody, people give me stuff all the time. They find stuff at estate sales and things like that. I hand it over to you, I'm very appreciative. And, and, and McMean County has been playing football forever. Actually, they actually started, you know, we normally say they started playing in 27. That was the, when the start of the official record. But they actually started playing in 2000, rather 1912, which was well over 100 years ago. And they played for nine years. It was more like intramural football back then. There was no association, there was no state association. They did that until 1918 when World War I broke out and then they sort of disbanded and then they got back together in 1927. So that was, uh, that was when they actually did the first start of it was. And there were some notes here that I think Felix Harry, you know, L.J. Harry, was Felix's dad. Uh, had put together, and some of you, some of you coaches might get a kick out of this. It says, uh, uh, J.P. Cartwright was a head coach at McMahon County one time, which was Jimmy Cartwright's uh, dad, which is Casey Cartwright's grandfather, you know, Casey Roberts. And, uh, uh, of course, uh, it says, I remember Coach Cartwright gave the school his equipment or sold it to us for almost nothing. Uh, Selling the idea of a bigger and better program to the fans was no small job. At the end of the first year, it succeeded in collect. This was back in the in the 30s, late 30s. In 36 and 37, they got $1,700, and out of this, were able to improve the quality of their equipment. They also put in some additional equipment, put in for some additional equipment, and they wanted some good shoes. It said. And I remember all players in competition had been fitted for good footwear. In 37 and 38, Frank Dittmore took over the program. 
And uh, that year, the great, it was the greatest year they had in income. They got $2,900. Now they all had good shoes and good helmets, and they all got blankets. All the football players had blankets. It was cold. It was colder back then when they played ball. But they said it uh, cost an average of $500 a year to replace and repair playing equipment. The uniform for a player cost $50 a piece and would last about four years. It was well taken care of and cleaned and repaired annually. Still do that? $50 and keep it for four years. <laughs> so, and there are, the history of McMinn County football is dotted with, with names like Fred Pewitt, who was a judge here in town, Frank Dittmore, Philmont Eves, who owned a hosiery store, and uh, or rather hosiery mill, and then, of course, the Mayfields all play, too. So it's, it's um, I was actually given a handwritten piece of paper by a gentleman who played on the 1927 football team uh, about 15 or 20 years ago, and I've held on to that, too. He gave me the scores of all the games that they played, and some of the players on the team. It's, it's been a great experience being a part of this high school football program, and uh, I really, really enjoyed watching you guys play this year. Uh, of course, I've probably been, as I said, closer to this team because of uh, watching them play when they were juniors. And uh, it was special getting to see them come up to the ranks of high school. And it was just a shame, although Bo says he's forgotten it, I haven't. And I uh, don't forget Thomas Bennett. As a matter of fact, Jack Henderson, who was coaching McMinn in 66 and 67, when he left here, he went to DB. And so uh, uh, DB is no longer on my list of favorite teams. Uh, but uh, this was a special team, and I'm not going to take anything away from what they have accomplished. If you guys need to hold your head up high, high school football is a special, special thing. Uh, uh, the 75 team, I was coaching baseball in, in town at that time, senior little league, and I got to know a lot of those guys who were playing football as well. And to this day, when I'm around those guys that play on that 75 team, we sit and talk about football from 1975. That's how special and important it is. And uh, you guys give yourselves a pat on the back and your parents as well and your coaches as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm.